Hey folks! So we're going to go over a few examples from chapter 15. This is on page 347 in your book. And the first part of chapter 15 is to recognize the difference between a parameter and a statistic. And so if you look at this example, Florida played a key role in recent presidential elections. Voter registration records in February 2014 show that 39% of Florida voters are registered as Democrats and 35% as Republicans. So because that is from the voter registration records in Florida, the big picture, these are both parameters, P, so you would identify those as P for parameter. Then you get into to test a random digit dialing device that you plan to use the poll voters for 2014 election. You call 250 randomly chosen residential telephones of registered voters contacted, 34% are registered Democrats. That would be a statistic. The law of large numbers is another concept in chapter 15. And the big idea with this is um, that's how insurance companies rely on and, and come out ahead. Because if you think about it, if you were to gather 12 policies, like in this example, you um, maybe of those 12 policies, you might have six claims, right? Where it's going to cost the insurance company a lot of money to pay for um, the fire damage or the flood destroying their apartment and whatnot. What they bank on is the idea that they're going to sell thousands and thousands of policies, which would bring their average cost per person to $125. And that's this big idea that for a very large sample, if n is large, we're going to say that x bar is going to approach the population mean. So in this case, we're hoping that it's going to get to $125 per person. So they're banking on the idea with the law of large numbers that if they sell enough policies, it's going to be, um, they're going to have their average per person cost of $125, that means they can set their premiums at that price and come out ahead enough to stay in business. This example is on page 352, and the 2012 American Time Use Survey contains data on how many minutes of sleep per night each of the 12,443 survey participants estimated they get. The times follow the normal distribution with a mean of 528.8 minutes and a standard deviation of 137.2 minutes. A simple random sample of 100 of the participants has a mean time of 509.23 um, minutes. A second simple random sample of size 100 has a mean of 530.32 minutes. After many simple random samples, the mean values of the sample mean follow the normal distribution with the mean of 528.8 minutes and a standard deviation of 13.72 minutes. So for the first part, what is the population and what value does the population distribution describe? So if we look at this, and I'm just going to get our free hand, let's first highlight this is our entire population, the 12,443 survey participants estimated the sleep that they get. We know it follows a normal distribution with a mean of 528.8 minutes and a standard deviation of 137 minutes. So then, so the difference between population distribution and sampling distribution. Part A, we have what is the population, but we know of the participants, um, the 12,443. And we also know that it has a mean of 528.8 minutes and a standard deviation of 137.2. So that is given, and that is like chapter three. If you think about chapter three, how do you describe this population? This distribution describes the minutes of sleep per night for the individuals of the population. So we're thinking about individuals here. When we get into the sampling distribution, this is different. This, what does the sampling distribution of X describe? In this case, we can say that we have a normal distribution 
with a mean of 528.8 because that actually, the mean, if your sample size is large enough, the sample mean X bar is going to be the same as the population mean, which is mu as in part A. So we're going to say 528.8, but now the difference is, is that we have this uh, uh, 13.72 for our standard deviation. Standard deviation, to find that second part, you take the standard sigma and you divide by the square root of um, your sample size. And if you see in this case, they took 137.2 and they divided it by the square root of 100 because that's the sample size. Square root of 100 is 10, so that's why we got our 13.72 here. Let's just change that to a period. So that's the difference. And what does the sample size describe? It's not the sample size, it's the sampling distribution. What it describes is the distribution of average sleep time for 100 randomly selected individuals from this population. So when you are doing your practice this week in your quiz, keep an eye out for if they're asking for individuals, in which case you just keep it the same, 528, you keep the mean, and your standard deviation of the population, and you can figure out um, questions relating to individuals using chapter three methods. If you're doing, um, if they're asking you about what is the sampling, the sampling distribution, what's the average sleep time for the 100, in this case, randomly selected individuals, or what's the average, whatever it is that they're asking, you're going to use this new thing with sigma, the standard deviation, divided by the square root of your sample size, and that's your new sampling distribution. So from here on out, we're going to be using often our sampling distribution over our population distribution. Okay, guys, this is my favorite theorem, the central limit theorem. I heart it. Um, basically, the idea of this, this is how we can gather information about a population just by using their samples. And we're going to use more realistic uh, means in the future when we can use our t-distributions and proportions of populations. But for now, what we can do is we're going to assume from any population, this is the cool thing, the population doesn't have to be normal, but if you take a sample of size n, and if that sample is big enough, what the central limit theorem says is that the sampling distribution of it is going to, of the sample mean, is going to be approximately normal. Even if you have a skewed distribution, if you saw that example that we did in class with household income, how it's a skewed right distribution. But if you calculate a big enough sample, take a big enough sample and calculate the means and look at the distribution of all those sample means, you will see that it is approximately normal. The mean is going to be the same as the population mean. And the only thing that changes is your Standard deviation narrows because think about a distribution of a bunch of means. It's going to narrow your chances because all those outliers that are far, far away from your center are going to get um, averaged out by gathering like a sample size of 30. If I get a, a low um, number zero and I get an extreme for household income of 3,000, 300,000, the averages, it's going to narrow our um, distribution. So that's why we decrease our standard deviation by a factor of square root of 10. So you're dividing by the square root of, excuse me, not square root of 10, square root of n. So that is the big idea of the central limit theorem. So learn it, love it, and we're going to be using it from here on out. Okay. So more on insurance. An insurance company knows that in the entire population of millions of apartment owners, the mean annual loss from damage is $125. And the standard deviation of the loss is $300. The distribution of losses is strongly right skewed. Most policies have zero loss, but if you have large losses, 
If the company sells $10,000 or 10,000 policies, can it safely base its rates on the assumption that the average loss will be no greater than $135? So this is um, a great question. Once again, does it, does everybody understand the idea of what a strongly right skewed situation would look like? You're up here because you have zero losses for most folks. Um, so we're in the zero loss and this is like, this is money for insurance. So we're like over here and we might be strongly right skewed with a few pulling us out. Maybe the average, it says the average loss is in the 125 region. Okay. So that's kind of the idea. This is a population with zero, um, basically mostly zero losses, but then like there's a couple where you have a fire, like I said before, or a flood. Okay. But what you do is now that we know that we have a, a sample of size 10,000, we can do a sampling distribution and use the fact that we know our sampling distribution by the central limit theorem is going to be normal. The mean is going to be the same as the population mean, 125, and our standard deviation is going to be 300 divided by the square root of 10,000. So this is our sampling distribution. Sorry, my writing is a little sloppy on this. I'm figuring it out. And this is by the central limit theorem. I'm going to be using CLT by that. Okay, so sampling distribution of this. We're going to go into Desmos right now, and I'm going to show you how to calculate, because what we want to do is we want to find the probability of policies we want to see of our means, as it's saying. So if the company sells this, can it safely base its rates on the assumption that the average loss, that's our X bar, will be no greater, it can equal 135, but no greater than hundred and thirty five dollars so that's what we're looking for for this answer so let's go into Desmos and follow along too if you can so once again we have a normal distribution thanks to the central limit theorem the sampling distribution the mean is going to be the same as the population mean of 125 but my standard deviation it shrinks a little bit so you take your old standard deviation of 300 divide by the square root of your sample size, in this case, is 10,000. If you simplify that, you have a normal distribution of 125. And then 10,000, the square root of that is 100. And 100 over 3, or 300 over 100 is equal to 3. So we've got this is my new distribution. So when I type this in, and I'm just going to do it again so you guys can see, type in normal dist, and then we have our 125 for the average mean of insurance policies, the cost. My new standard deviation is 3, and you do the CDF, and we are going to go from negative infinity, so just do something like less than zero, negative 10 should be enough. And we're going to go up to, because we want to make sure that it doesn't exceed 135, no greater. And I'll write that down again so you guys can see it. So you can see immediately, and I'm going to do my zoom fit. Whoa, look at that. It's basically everything. See where your mean is on this picture? So we've got a mean of 125, that's what we described. 135 is way over here, right? It's coming, going off the graph, but that's 135 right there. And basically, I'm covering most of my graph. So 0.99, 957, right? So remember what we were finding, the probability of the sample means being less than, not exceeding $135. Because if we can do that per person, then the insurance policy is going to have enough money to stay afloat, right? So what is the probability? The probability is 
nine, seven, thanks to Desmos. Okay, so what does that mean in terms of this situation? I'm going to open a text box because my writing isn't so nice today on this. So let's see. Let's just write it out. What does that mean? I'm going to write out in spite of the skewness of the population, we can be about 99.96, as you can see there, percent certain that average losses will not exceed $135. Per policy. Yay! So this was just from the answer in the back of the book, but I wanted to use their language. So in spite of the skewness of the population, we can be about 99.96% um, certain that the average losses will not exceed $135 per policy. So I hope that makes sense. Um, just if you guys wanted to play around with this, remember, what would it mean just so you guys can use Desmos if I wanted to, for instance, go like, what is, um, what would the average, the, the probability that I would select, um, average policies between maybe 120 and let's just say 130. So you can see that you can find all of these different answers. If you're going in between, or if you're going exceeding or below, this is in between 90 percent of our policies of the sample means that we select are going to be below between 120 to 130. Okay.